Oh, it's here. It's happening. Okay. We are officially live right here at the Eraser Institute, the place where we talk about racism and try and find ways to address it. Action. It's all about action. And so this is our Real Talk, Real Walk uh, live stream. We do this once a month for those that have not been following that are new to the game. Um, and we do this once a month based on uh, one documentary or a movie or something like that that we sort of focus in on to try and address some key issues when it comes to doing anti-racist work. And so um, I am here uh, today with Marjorie. Marjorie is like, mm. Marjorie is one of the best people in the whole entire world, my friends. Um, and before Marjorie and I dive into some conversations about this month's uh, movie and documentary, I want us to start well. So we are here. I'm hosting this conversation from my home in Kitchener, this land held down, cared for, loved, and stewarded by the Haudenosaunee, the Anishinaabe, and the neutral people. Um, we are on the Haldeman track very important for us to know that. But more important than knowing the land um, that you are on, which you can Google, you can actually just go to the Eraser Institute, uh, eraserinstitute.com. And on the right, you will see a little tab that links you to uh, know the land. And you can plug in where you are and you can find out more about the land that you are on. But the work that I have been um, told to do based on uh, incorporating land acknowledgements in our day to day is to make a concrete connection between the reality of having a conversation on stolen land and the topic of conversation you're about to have makes it more action oriented and it makes you have to sit down and kind of reflect a little bit more about why it is that you are beginning a conversation with the land acknowledgement in the first place. Um, and for me, the connection is direct in, in the topic of our documentary, the school to prison pipeline. Um, what we do know from the research is that indigenous community members alongside black community members are overrepresented in our criminal justice system. And what we do know is that there are concerted efforts to uh, explain away this overrepresentation, not as a system harming uh, community members, but as individuals that are problematic and that they deserve this reality in our history books. Um, and I am here to say um, and stand by that this is a systems problem. And in fact, discussions about the school to prison pipeline are so important to explain how come we find indigenous community members and black community members overrepresented in the criminal justice system. Um, and how early the crafting of access to prison as opposed to uh, areas of their life where they can thrive happens. It is not because of the individuals. It is because of systems that don't see the greatness of these individuals because of racism targeting Indigenous communities, racism targeting Black communities, etc. And so for me, that connection is part of what's driving this conversation more generally. And so I'm here today with Marjorie um, to have a discussion about the school to prison pipeline. Marjorie, say hello. Hey there, people. Hello, people. Um, and Marjorie and I were sort of chit-chatting a little bit uh, before I pressed the little live button talking about the different ways that this pipeline appears. So I want us, uh, first off, if you haven't looked at the website recently, the uh, documentary that we were looking at was a documentary that was produced by Black, the Black Legal Action Clinic. Is it clinic or center? I'm gonna have to Google that. Um, but it was by Black and it is the uh, school to prison pipeline in Ontario. Now, a lot of people have heard about this notion of the school to prison pipeline and assume that it is something that only happens in the United States of America. And part of why I brought this, uh, this particular documentary to our attention here at the Eraser Institute is because there are concrete examples of what that school to prison pipeline looks like in Canada and in particular in Ontario that people don't want to talk about. Um, and so Marjorie and I were chit-chatting and we're going to have a bit of a discussion now um, about what that pipeline looks like. 
So with that as our starting point, um, I want to remind people that sometimes these kinds of terms like the school to prison pipeline understood in theory makes you assume that what it is that happens, like um, there is a direct, a young child goes direct to prison. When in actuality, to get them to the end of that pipeline, a number of things happen from the system towards them, towards their family, that leads them more easily in that direction. It's kind of like streaming them into a place where they can be among others that are overrepresented in this criminal justice system. And I want us to start by talking about what that looks like from the outset. So Marjorie, my first question to you to get this conversation started um, is to ask you, when you think about this school to prison pipeline and you think about your particular context, what does that pipeline look like at the outset, like at that very beginning point? What are some examples that you have seen um, of what, what actually propels somebody through that pipeline right here? I, I can start at the very beginning where a child comes to go into our school system. I have a child from another country who enters our elementary school system. They speak English, they write English, they comprehend English. They have an accent. Mm -hmm. The moment they come into school, there is already an assumption made that whatever learning they had before they came there was inferior. Mm -hmm. Therefore, they are dropped, often dropped a grade, or worse yet, they're put into um, an ESL class or a class for people with learning disabilities. These are necessary classes. We have them for a reason why these children get put into that as a whole other story. Mm -hmm. So what mm -hmm. happens when you have a child who is put into one of these classes or has dropped a grade? What happens when they have already done all this work and have actually moved ahead of most of their peers already? What happens if they are exceptional? What happens then? So you have a child who is bored. You have a child who finishes their work in five minutes and then tries to help somebody else and is trying to help everybody else with their work because they know how to do it and their work is done. Mm -hmm. That child is then considered to be disruptive once a child has a label of disruptive, it's all over. Mm -hmm. Because then whatever they do, they're being disruptive, which means that they're bad, mm -hmm. that they have to be punished. And if it's one thing that we know in our school system is that the way punishment is meted depends directly, directly proportional to the color of your skin. Mm -hmm. If you are non-white, especially if you are black or indigenous, punishments are much more harsh. Somebody might get a talking to and have to stay inside at lunchtime versus you are suspended from school. Once you have a certain amount of suspensions, you are expelled. Once you're expelled, you can't get into another school. And you're labeled for life. Yeah. I want you to pause there before you continue with what the rest of that journey looks like. Because um, so we sometimes talk about the disciplining of children um, in school and out of school. But let's keep it in school for a moment. And we talk about the harshness of discipline when it comes to Black students, Indigenous students, non-white students, what that looks like. Usually um, you're suspended, uh, you are you know, removed from certain things where you would get that free play. They remove you from those things. They say the labels of disruption. But we often um, 
sort of separate out those discussions from the school to prison pipeline. And what I think is really important about where Marjorie started is that those discussions are actually not separate. They are part of the pipeline because the minute that you allow the adults that are inside those spaces, educational spaces are meant to grow you as a person so that you can explore what you, you know, creatively explore what you want to be when you grow up and attain your dreams, etc. The minute you start to allow the adults in that system to be more harsh in their punishments to particular children, and the particular children are non-white children, you start to actually impact the trajectory for them to go that path from school to their dreams versus the other path, which is from school to the criminal justice system. And it happens in two ways. In one way, there's the actual um, uh, telling of other adults in that space. So there's a lot of chatter that can happen in a school. It can be between parents, it can be between um, teachers at the school, etc., about that particular child. So as Marjorie was mentioning, saying this child is disruptive, I've had to put that on the report card. The report card goes into their Ontario student record, the OSR. So now it, it's carried with them from grade to grade. Those are all system things that are happening to carry that through. But the other piece of it, and it comes up in the, um, in the documentary as well, is the psychological impact of being told that you are doing something wrong when you're trying to help the other students. So I'm gonna ask Marjorie to pick up their story from that place when this student who is exceptional finishes their work quickly and they're not told, oh my gosh, good for you. Here's some extra additional work or let's do the assessment to see if we need to put them into a different enrichment class. But instead is told because you didn't slow it down <laughs> and because you didn't um, do as you were told, and now you're trying to help somebody, that's not your role. Stay in your lane. And that discussion happens when a child is so young. That too becomes part of what can propel you from school to that engagement with the criminal justice system. Not because of you, but because of how the system is operating and impacting or treating you. So Marjorie, take us now from there. So you're, here you are. So let's... Been Disruptive. Let's forward. Let's mm -hmm. forward this child a couple of years. The child is now understood to be exceptional. So what do you do with exceptional children? You usually advance them because this is something to be developed. This is something to encourage, something to stimulate. But this child, who is now acknowledged to be exceptional, is not advanced. Because remember, they're a disruptive person. This child is not advanced because we don't think that they could manage to operate outside of their peer group. Mm -hmm. OK, OK, that, that could be a thing. Um, so how do we do this? Can we advance the work that she gets? And we wait and we wait and nothing changes. The child who is known to be exceptional, who is known to be heads and shoulders above her people, her peers are still, is still sitting in a class without advance work, without any encouragement or or stimulation and is left in the class. And then things start to happen. And this is where, when you talk about psychological things, mm -hmm. this child's mental health goes downhill. She starts cutting herself. She starts experimenting with drugs. She becomes withdrawn. She becomes combative. But what did you expect? What did you expect? Other children who are exceptional are celebrated. They're advanced. They're, they're sent to special schools. They are, you know, all kinds of things happen because we foster this kind of thing. But this child, mm -hmm. 
has been left to stagnate, has been made to feel bad about herself, whose mind is a gem, but is now turning on itself because it has no stimulation. Mm -hmm. And her mental health has gone down the hill. And here we are begging a school to do something with this child. Mm -hmm. And that kind of behavior is because of her nature, because she's disruptive, because she, she always does something wrong. She's bad. We have and labeled her it. she now believes it. And that's it. And I think that's the thing. There's so much within that pipeline, not very far near the beginning, that certain messaging starts to get internalized. So you start to believe that you are not smart. You start to believe that you are not worthy. You start to believe that the only option for you or opportunity for you does not lie in that big dream that you have and does not lie even in the topic in a school that was of interest to you, but instead is a very stereotypical pathway for you. And oftentimes, as you walk that stereotypical path, now you have, in fact, justified, you've demonstrated a justification for whatever these labels were that weren't supposed to be put on you to begin with, but were. And then it, as you get further, let's say now you jump them to high school, the, the um, beginning period where you were first ignored and not held or cared for or treated with respect and kindness is so far removed from the behaviors that a high school teacher, let's say, is experiencing that they don't even bother to look back there, which is interesting because what I have also heard is that when a student is disruptive in high school and they are white, we do sometimes ask, what is the root cause of this? Why, why did this happen? What is the history of this particular child that would have it? How can we help them? Whereas when these are, these are young people who we are associating with the prison side of the pipeline, we don't bother to ask that because we believe that they inherently belong on that route to this criminal justice system. They belong within that pipeline. So Marjorie, um, in the work that you do, whether it's people that you've chatted with, the folks that you help, the experiences that you've had, if, if you're um, encountering somebody who's sort of enraveled in that pipeline, who is within your sphere of influence that you feel you can reach out to and what makes them sort of influential to be able to sort of change that tra trajectory or assist in getting somebody outside of that that pipeline what so, are the kinds of things you look for for that person in the past what had happened is like for instance i had a young girl who maybe not exceptional but bright and focused on what she wanted to do and she was hitting roadblocks. So she came to me, I looked at it and I went into school. I sat down with the principal and eventually one of her teachers because she had in her head what she wanted to do. So she needed to do certain courses. She was being blocked from doing courses. She mm -hmm. was being told that, that she wasn't capable of doing those courses. And so it didn't make sense to enroll her in those courses. Um, we had situations where the work that she did, the grade was not reflective of the work. And we actually had to challenge the grades that she was given and they had to be changed. Mm -hmm. In one case, was agreed that the grade would be changed and it wasn't. And we had to go back because then her transcript was reflecting a worse grade, which meant it, it actually affected whether or not she'd be able to get into her program for university. Yeah. So, you know, these kinds of things were happening and it would be the parent and yeah. myself advocating for them and going to the school and the principal and the uh, blah, 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 blah. And it's onerous and it's difficult and it's hard on the child because, you know, they have to go back to school to that teacher. 
Yeah. And sometimes that teacher is going to take it out on them. What is happening these days, thankfully, is that they now have people in place, at least in the public school board, who are there specifically to deal with the issues of racialized kids who are not being treated appropriately in school. So there's actually somewhat of a change systematically. Yeah. Admitting, which is a big part of it, that there is a problem. And these people in particular will step in. There's a lady by the name of Phyllis Prepper who is fabulous, mm -hmm. who does this kind of work. And now I refer parents to her yeah. when they have a problem. And there are a lot of problems, let me tell you. And so, um, well, and so first off, shout out to Phyllis mm -hmm. for the work that you're doing. Those system navigators, like that is such an interesting thing that is developing uh, here in, in the province of Ontario to have these navigators whose literal job is to help you to maneuver through a system because they know where that system is most likely to lead you to. And where um, it will fail you. Yeah. This is it. Yeah. And that failing that we talk about, again, I don't want it to appear to be over dramatic. I want to be honest about where it is that we are in our province of Ontario and in this country that we that some call Canada. Uh, across Turtle Island, one of the things that we know is that those discussions, the need for the system navigator is not separate and apart from the discussion of what this pipeline looks like right here on, on this land. To have somebody who has to actually be hired within the system to protect Black and Indigenous and uh, there's a, a Muslim student uh, systems navigator in our region, like to have to put those in place is a recognition, as Marjorie said, of the issues that are impacting these students. And it's also, oddly enough, a recognition of a system that isn't yet ready to fully adjust. Because what, we what that means, though, Laura May, is that, yay, we have these systems navigators. But this is a project. And this is a beginning because yeah. what has to happen is a system has to change. That's yeah, it. They are acknowledging that the system is broken and they're bringing in, you know, somebody to help deal with that. But the system itself yes. is broken and they need to fix it. So, yay, we've got the system navigators, but now we need to really look at how do we fix the system? I mean, I have a young guy who was getting ready to go to university and he wanted um, advice. And, you know, looking at what program he wanted to do in university, what he wanted to do, he wanted advice from his guidance team at his school as to where he should apply and scholarships and all those kinds of things. This young man has a 95% average average is 95 percent and every time he went to guidance he was told no 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 what you need to do is to go into trades now it's nice you know what trades is an absolute fabulous thing you can make a living at it if that's the way you're inclined hooray let's do it the man has a plan he knows what he wants to do Mm -hmm. He wants to go to university. He wants to pursue a certain goal. And he's capable of this. Why? Why would you not support him in that goal? Yeah. And on the other hand, I have a youngster who wants to go into trades. For his four years in high school, I could not get him into the trade that he wanted to get into because they had no programming to put him in. They have a title and they have a thing, but they don't really have anything to put him into it. So what are we doing? Well, and I, so as I think 
about this notion of your sphere of influence, what we know is that um, the system wants to keep these stories individual as opposed to recognize them as connected and interconnected. And so as long as those stories become individual stories of individual students, we can remain distant from the reality that these are system problems that need to shift in, in bigger ways so that more kids are actually provided with a pathway to what it is that they, they want to be doing and the path they want to in. Uh, we should be facilitating Absolutely. them achieving these things. I'm tired of teachers saying, listen, you know, we don't think that they can do this. So we just think they should go into school to work program so that they can just, you know, get out and get to work because that's what they need to do. Mm -hmm. but I'm like, the child deserves a chance. School is supposed to give you the opportunity to develop, to find how far you can go, yeah. to pursue your goals of where yeah. you want to go. And yet for our kids, it's we're just repeatedly being told, oh, no, no. Or the better one is, well, you know, they, they can't afford that. They, yeah. they need to go to work. You know what we would have lost in our society if we did that to everybody? The brains and the, the inventions and all these amazing bodies of work that we would lose, that we are losing. Yeah. Because we're not developing people to their potential, but we're de developing them to just go out and work and be just a grunt for the rest of their life. Well, so when I think, again, when I think about these experiences and the fact that we're in 2023 and we're still talking, the, another word for what it is that Marjorie's referring to, um, it, it's streaming, right? So once again, we're in 2023 talking about um, the streaming of young children uh, from the path, away from the path that they want to explore and towards the path that the system has deemed acceptable for them. And as we stream folks, that's part of the school to prison pipeline. As we over discipline folks, that's part of the school to prison pipeline. As we deny families access to justice within that system where they can advocate for their kids so that they are provided with the tools that they need to achieve their goals, that's part of the school to prison pipeline. I think if there's one thing to, to re-emphasize, it's that that pipeline starts very young. There are There's data that exists that demonstrates that from kindergarten, mm -hmm. when they enter into the public system, students that are non-white are more harshly disciplined than their white peers. They're not provided with the care and the, the support that one needs to actually learn how to change your behavior um, in fact, they are not taught the skills that are needed that demonstrate empathy, because when they try and advocate for themselves, which, to be honest, a lot of parents are teaching their children to advocate for themselves. Why? Because they're experiencing racial trauma inside the spaces that they're in. Little girl in, in school. Online. So your online forum, where is a teacher when some child is telling her that um look at her skin it's dirty she's dirty making fun of her of her skin color and her hair where is the teacher in all of this yeah the teacher comes back in time for her to hear this one fighting back against this blatant racism and who gets in trouble the little girl what happens to the other girl what happened? Nothing. Or at the most, you know, oh, we don't call people names. Well, you know what? That, that doesn't fly. But meanwhile, my little girl has a suspension. Yeah. Yeah. This and that the stays on record. So here's the other thing that I think when we're trying to think through our sphere of influence, I think it's really, really important for us to understand how the systems operate. So in our discussion right now, we're speaking specifically about 
um, the school to prison pipeline. So our starting point is in the education system. And one of the things that folks may not know if they're not from that system is that what gets recorded in your OSR and your Ontario student record and whatever that record is in, across the provinces um, remains with you. It travels with the, with the child. So there's sort of off the cuff conversations that might be happening between people, but there is a physical record that exists in the world that says, this is this child's history. And inside that record in Ontario, I can speak to what is inside some of those records include things like, um, let's say there was a, a breakdown in the family and there is a parenting order, right? And so uh, one parent picks up the child from school this time, this time, this time, another parent this time, this time. Those kinds of things are actually incorporated into this child's Ontario student record because there is a history of how to best care for this child or who is allowed to pick up this child or what is happening with this child. But also within that can be other things that get inserted into said record. The history of suspensions is inserted into that record. Um, any kind of disciplinary procedures inserted into that record, conversations that are sometimes happening. Um, for instance, if you get a phone call uh, about your child and you're told, uh, we're going to have a conversation with the social worker and the principal or the vice principal and the teacher and the special education teacher, and we're just going to talk about how we can protect, uh, um, support your child those discussions can sometimes also be included in your Ontario student record. What that does, though, is it creates a file that's tracked what has happened to your child without the, the particular context that we are discussing, which means that it can then be used in a particular way to either support or not support the child. Mm -hmm. So one of the things that is very important for us to recognize is that the systems are set up to do things with a theoretical good in mind. We create those records so that it is easier for the child to thrive because we already know this information about the child. But when we don't think about how racism operates, we don't recognize and acknowledge that those same things that were created with a theoretical good in mind can actually be turned against the children and their families. Mm -hmm. And that sphere of influence then can be the people that you know that understand those systems. They are the people that you can call on and say, hey, I'm having this experience. What do I need to do here? They can be um, the educators that you know in your community. They can be the advocates that you know in your community in our system. They can be the, um, the system navigators become part of that sphere of influence that you can speak to for support for this child. And I would argue that being able to connect the dots between all of this is just as important. So being able to advocate for your child and say, but I also know of another family that has experienced something similar, makes the system have to pay attention to the fact that this is a systemic issue, as opposed to just a little bitty individual issue and somebody made a boo-boo in the midst of raising your, uh, working with you as you raise your child, right? Um, so one of the uh, other pieces that we often talk about within the Eraser Institute, we try really hard to think about our spheres of influence because as we understand who has it, can influence the system and, and uh, sort of impact in a positive way, readjust these outcomes, we also have to think about um, what we need to be courageous enough to mobilize our privilege. So when I think of myself as a parent, there are certain things that I do that mobilize my privilege to support my kids. I have to say for the record that I too, despite all of the things that I talk about and all of the things that I have been doing in community, have had to advocate just like all the other parents to support my kids who identify as black inside the school system here, in Toronto, where we used to be, in various other areas, because the, the reality of the stereotypes around race are literally that sticky, that doesn't matter what you have achieved, that sometimes you too have to do all of the other kinds of advocacy and rely on all of those same supports. 
So when I'm speaking to folks about um, recognizing who is in your sphere of influence, I want you to know that I have had to do the same thing. I have had to call on people that are within my sphere of influence to help me with my own children so I can wear the hat of parent and let somebody else be wearing the hat of advocate mm -hmm. to navigate some of these things. Marjorie, you also, you've run for elected office. You're recognized in community for advocacy work. When it comes to advocating for your children, have you had to draw on the the systems around I, you? I, I will tell you, when my children came to this country when they were 14, they went into school. And can you imagine? I, I Some days I felt like I was going in every week to mm -hmm. talk to these people. But the straw that broke me was when my children came home and they were crying because the narcs come to school. They pull out the people who are known and they search their bags and they search their lockers and they search their person for drugs. Well, because my two little Jamaican born girls are new to the school well, don't you know, they're pulling them out also and searching their lockers and their bags and their person because clearly if you're Jamaican, you must be dealing drugs. Well, you know, I, I sailed into school and I'm like, what is this? Mm -hmm. Are my children making trouble? Oh no, Mrs. Knight, your children don't make trouble. I said, are they hanging out with the wrong people? Oh, no, Miss Knight, your, your children? No, no, we wish there were more children like them. I said, so explain to me why you're allowing this to happen. Mm -hmm. Why would you allow this to happen when you know my children are not like that? And so it just came down to they mm -hmm. were stereotyped. Mm -hmm. And this, that was enough. Black, Jamaican, must be doing drugs. So yeah. after I had to have a lawyer draft a letter for me to let them know that I was suing everybody as well as the principal for the harm that they were doing to my children, it mm -hmm. stopped. But I would tell you something, and I'll go further. A couple of years later, when I was talking to a group of their friends from school, what I then realized was every single black child was pulled and searched every time they came into that school. Yeah. So they stopped doing it to my children, but they never blinked for the other ones. This is, and so here is, here is the thing that is um, so difficult for us to, to recognize and yet so important for us to recognize. What happens to the individual child is usually connected to that bigger, broader stereotype and pathway that's being formed, etc. And so when we advocate for our individual children, we're also um, tasked with finding a way to advocate for that broader group. But yeah. you're exhausted when you are a parent advocating for your individual child. And so what I ask in, in I'm putting into the universe is that when and if you are called upon as part of that social, um, that sphere of influence around somebody who's experiencing uh, racism within the school system in this case, um, or within any other system, but let's stay focused on the school because we're talking school to prison pipeline, that part of your job is to connect the dots because the parent who is in the center of that, um, that issue is going to be exhausted and not have the time. But you on the outside of it, on the periphery of said issue, can start to pull the reports. There are reports in the Peel District School Board about what anti-Black racism has looked like. There are reports of um, what anti-Indigenous racism looks like for people literally across this country. There are examples of what racism looks like in schools. And when you're there advocating for an individual, part of your job can be to connect it to those reports. Because when you do that, you are connecting the dots. 
And the system doesn't want you to connect the dots because then they have to make system changes. But our job, uh, in my opinion, my responsibility to the people in the world when I have new information and new knowledge is to help to be part of that resistance. Let's all commit to being part of that resistance. So we've talked about this fear of influence. We've talked about the mobilizing of the privilege. In my humble opinion, when you do that dot connecting, you are actually mobilizing your privilege. You're recognizing what it is that you know, and you're connecting it to other people who have had that same experience. And, and as what, you, and what do you, what I learned from that yes. experience was that when I went in, because there was an issue with my children, mm -hmm. is that I started to broaden to see, you know, what if I had asked the question, "Are you doing this to any other children?" Yeah. Yeah. Or if I had asked, well, who are the children that are being pulled out? Then I would have known who these were. Yeah. Because sadly, some of them have gone down that pathway because you tell them enough times. Yeah. If you're going to get beat up all the time for being a wolf, well, eventually you're going to say, yeah, well, I might as well wolf. That's it. But that taught me when you talk about spheres of influence yeah to find out who else and because, don't because together yes together yes 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 and don't um be fooled when people say that the data doesn't exist so i i don't know what has been happening this week but i'm telling you i have been saying this sentence repeatedly no data is data. So if I go to the school and I say, I would like to know um, the racial and ethnic background of the students that are experiencing, in, in Marjorie's example, that are experiencing the um, impromptu searches inside the school, right? I want to know some background information about these young people. And you are told that data is not collected. That on in and of itself is data that you don't collect the data, so you don't have a sense of what's happening, so you don't pay attention to what racism looks like in the system that already has a multitude of reports demonstrating that Black, Indigenous, Brown, non-white students are disproportionately disciplined in this environment is a sign that you don't actually want to turn your attention to this. So I will now go to my parent council and I will ask for them to advocate for that data to be presented. or I will go to the write a letter to the Minister of Education and I will demand that that data is is found or I will go to the police services and I will ask them when you are collecting your data about you know use of force or blah 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 or blah 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 also collect the data about the number of times that you've entered into a school to do these kinds of searches like we we can influence and mobilize once we have more information about how these systems work and we can ask these questions to help us to be able to connect these dots. Because the more of that information that we have, the harder it is for the system and whoever it is, remember, systems are just people that are working day, you know, they're nine to five. That is the system, right? And so when we have this information, then we can do as I was looking, there's a, some comments, thank you to those folks that are watching. Um, and one person, Angela, has said school staff need more training and professional development. It is true that more training and professional development around these issues is extremely helpful. And the reports that we're asking folks, the data we're asking folks to keep on these types of issues will help that professional development and that training to be put into action. So one of the sort of an aside, but not, there's often a call for more training when it comes to addressing racism. But I'm finding that a lot of training that talks about addressing racism is missing the action piece. So if I bring in a bunch of guidance counselors, for instance, and I do a, a number of training modules with them around what streaming looks like in schools, because that happens. Um, the question for me is always, can we make sure that before they leave that training, they've documented two or three actions in their day-to-day -day, in the particular way in which their guidance office operates at their particular school that they can make a change in that setting because if they can start to think about how they can action the training then the change will happen in the system 
But if we rely solely on training, disconnected, note that disconnection seems to be a theme in this discussion, training disconnected from the day-to-day -day reality, training disconnected from the reports that exist, training disconnected from what I see as actionable in my particular, um, my particular sphere when I get back to my job as a guidance counselor, for instance, then nothing actually changes. But the system gets to put a check mark saying they did the training. So no, no allowing of the system to do their check marks if we can't actually see action on the ground, which leads me to one other thing that I would suggest for those that become part of somebody's sphere of influence, and we are all part of somebody's sphere of influence, is to ask for um, somebody to look at the changes in the system and document that. So if we fight to say, collect the data on, let's say, again, going back to Marjorie's uh, example of searches in the school, then I also want a year out and two years out to go back and do replicate that data collection activity to make sure that change has actually happened. Because again, if we don't double check, then somebody will be able to say to us, well, we did what you asked for, which was just to collect the data or to just take a look at the system, but nobody is checking to see for the change. And I, from what I keep hearing is that we are having the same experiences over and over and over and over again. But if that's not documented in the language of that system, then they just allow us to keep having that harmful, harmful experience. Does we that mean also have to look at how training is done mm -hmm. talk um, to me about that and, and what what is the goal mm -hmm. of the training because i've been to so many where you just tick a box tick a box do you understand this oh yes do you understand? oh yes oh yes i heard about that oh yep yeah. yeah but so what have we achieved nothing we've yeah. spent four hours of our day oh, another training and you have learned nothing. And oh, yeah. Nothing, and you have not been held accountable to do anything. Well, this is it. This is and it. So how, how is the training done? Who is doing the training is also very important. Yeah. You know, no offense to people, but, well, yeah, I'm married to a black man, so I know about that. Well, no, not, not really. Yeah. And not that you couldn't be effective as a trainer either but who is training and how they're training people's perceptions how people look at things is so different absolutely we have to look at how we're doing these trainings and who is doing the training and um sharita is out in in my so this is streaming at all my different platforms and so um, I want to say thank you to those that are putting comments in because I can see some of the comments coming up. Sharita had put in representation matters and it's true. Yeah. Representation matters. And I would add that representation also has to be troubled a little bit. And I say, I, I say that because of this. If, if I am a black person who has survived our education system from kindergarten to grade 12 and landed into teacher's college, I am black in teacher's college and that's awesome. And I get my bachelor of arts, but nothing has actually changed in the training for my bachelor of arts. So I, or my get my bachelor of education, nothing has changed in my bachelor of education degree. Now I become a teacher. I haven't actually been taught anti-racist teaching pedagogies in that system. So now I am black as a teacher and I represent um, on the surface, black community members in that, in that, um, in that teaching space. But if I haven't been taught how to teach from an anti-racist uh, pedagogical perspective, then I might actually be asked to do things that are just as harmful as the white teacher who also walked through this program with me. And so what I, I say all of that, not to say that representation doesn't matter, but to say that representation has to be qualified as representation that is anti-racist. Like we're talking about addressing racism. I need anti-racist representation to be thriving inside the system. I need those tools to become part of the everyday tools 
in your Bachelor of Education so that you can actually do this kind of work from a place that understands how to hold both the person that's experiencing racial trauma and the system that you're trying to change and figure out what kinds of influences you can make in there. And so representation is important, training is important, but training qualified, not just any kind of training, yes. training that's, that provides action items at the end of it, training that makes me think about how I can do my job differently. I feel like right now we're in this, uh, people are, they're getting training fatigue and so oftentimes you're told to do all of this training. They're doing the training and they're snoozing in the back. Yep. Because there's but, it's but you know, it's, it's like people ask me to do anti-racism training. Yeah. And I won't. Because I am not qualified to do anti-racism training. What I am qualified to do is to walk into a workplace and we have a round table and we have a discussion about what racism looks like at work. And I can tell you how are things that you can combat that by being this way to your new coworkers or that way to racialized people or understanding context. Yes. I cannot do anti-Black racism training because I do not have the qualifications or enough knowledge to do it. I can talk about it, yeah. but I would not train on it. So yeah. it's, it's important. It's really important to understand that. Um, and so Kimiko is out here too. Thank you, Kimiko, for your comments. And there's a comment in here saying, training needs to be provided within the instructional day so that it's not optional. So there've yeah. been a couple of people that have said, yeah, and then when it's optional, people opt out of it. Mm -hmm. And oftentimes the folks that you're like, oh, this training needs to be there because these folks need that training, they opt out, right? You don't know what you don't need to know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and I have to tell you, in my humble opinion, once again, anti-racist training is also context specific, if if done well. So when I, there's, yes, theoretical things that I can talk about, but if I wanna keep it at theory, I'm not actually helping people apply it. So theory around anti-racist work, sure, maybe that isn't necessarily context specific, I would argue it is, but whatever. There's different things that you know would be in every kind of training, certain histories that you want to incorporate in your training. Yes, totally game needs to be in there. But the reality is when you have a rise of anti-Semitism in community, but you do training and you don't talk about that rise of anti-Semitism, you are not going to address anti-Semitism. You have to actually speak about what is happening and connect the training to what is going on in your community. If you have a rise of anti-Indigenous sentiment and you're doing anti-racism training and you don't connect it to that rise or you don't connect it to advocacy that's been happening in a particular area or you don't connect it to protests that are happening in a particular area, you're not actually helping the person that's on the receiving end of that training figure out how to apply it. What I do think and what I, I sometimes get a little bit nervous about is that we have decades and decades and decades of training without context and training without applying it. That a lot of people will be able to say, I can train on this, but they don't necessarily know how to apply it to a particular sector. Um, I know when I was a member of provincial parliament, if we do anti-racist training as a member, of, like with political leaders and folks that, let's say staff that are in politics and all of that stuff, but we can't apply that particular training to what life is like doing that kind of work, then that training is actually wasted. It's the same thing with teachers. If I have generic anti-racist training, but I don't actually know I'm delivering the training, but I don't understand how the education system works, then I might miss something as integral as explaining what's in an OSR and the impact of the OSR and what you record there on the lived experience of this black and indigenous and, and brown non-white student as they navigate the system. It's not that I'm a bad person, it's that I didn't understand the system that I was working in. I'm gonna stick a pin in that to say this, all oh, mummies with us again, my friends, I tell you that to tell you this. Um, it is so important to understand the context in which you are trying to deliver training of any kind. And in most other spaces, we do the work. If I wanted to open up a bakery 
And I decided I was going to open up that bakery in this little uh, town over here. I would do the research about that town. I would find out how many bakeries exist. I would find out what kinds of bakeries exist. I would find out the population of that town. I would ask questions about whether or not they like baked goods. I would do all of the groundwork before I open up my bakery. I, why would I do it? Because I want my bakery to be successful. I want, I'm going to say that again louder for the people in the back. Why would I do that research? Because I want my bakery to be successful. I believe that the reason we don't do that kind of groundwork when it comes to doing anti-racist work is because we don't necessarily want that work to be successful. That's the only reason why we would have a lack of attention and care on the context in which we are delivering this work, that we would have the resistance to the types of tools that do in fact make the application of anti-racist uh, anti -racist pedagogy work, like culturally responsive uh, instruction. Thank you for that note, Angela, um, also in my Facebook land. Um, but culturally responsive pedagogy, culturally responsive teaching is an action, an actionable item when it comes to training. And so there's resistance to it because people don't want to change that system. So as a, a, a sphere of influence, a member of the sphere of influence, wanting change within our system, wanting to divert people from the beginning points of school towards this end point of prison or the criminal justice system, we can collectively advocate for things like culturally responsive training to be done during the instructional day so that it is part of the conversation. I even think we should take up Marjorie's idea, move away from this notion of training and have discussions with folks. I think that when we're doing anti-racist work, we have to recognize that some of it is trial and error. And when I try something and it works or it doesn't work, I need to have a community of people I can speak to that I can say, this worked really well, but I think I might adjust it this way to make it work even better, or this didn't work at all. Can somebody help me with that? And so that you can go back and try again and feel held. It's part of why we have the Eraser Institute. So if anybody's out there wanting to be part of a community that will actually try and hold you to the best of our ability with the care that you need to do anti-racist work in whatever sector you're in, you can sign up anytime. Um, and you can become part of these conversations uh, as we talk about how to build an anti-racist world. Um, Marjorie, I am, we are sort of on the tail end of our discussion today. Uh, I wanted to thank you again for joining me in these discussions and being so open, not just with the uh, knowledge and the wisdom that you have, but also your openness of your own experiences, of what you have actually navigated. If you could leave the people that are watching with a little nugget of wisdom, what would you like to say to them before we wrap up this discussion about the school to prison pipeline right here in Ontario? Get involved. Mm -hmm. Get involved in the schools. If your children are in the school, are in school now, get involved in the school. Listen to what your children tell you about what's going on because they can tell you what's going on in class. Mm -hmm. And where something happens to your child, always seek to find out who else is being affected by it. Because when I say together, I mean together. It is an exhausting thing to advocate for people. So when there are two or three gathered who can advocate together, it makes a big difference yeah. to you, to the children, and to who you have to deal with. Then they know that it's not just one person that they can sweep under a rug. There's power in numbers. So always, if it's happening to your child, it's happening to somebody else's child. Find out who and then together make the plan and go. And if we need to come with you, you know, we will come with. You just reach out to us. Yeah. It's kind of how we roll. Yeah, we will it's come. kind of how we roll. So with that, my friends, I again want to say a big thank you to everybody who is watching, to those that are watching this, because this stays up on all of my social. A lot of people will watch at a later date. Um, I see you watching later too, so thank you for that. Um, thank you to everybody who is trying to take 
the anti-racist theory that they know and put it into practice. And please know that you can always go to the eraserinstitute.com. You can join us on this journey. You do not have to do this alone. Um, keep putting comments in on any of these. We will take these up as best as we can. Um, and I can't wait to see what we create. Peace. Yeah.